Hola a todos y muy buenos días. Gracias por conectarse y bienvenidos. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to this joint press conference between ECLAC and PAHO to launch the economy, the report called Health and Economy, a convergence needed to address COVID-19 and retake the path of sustainable development in Latin America and the Caribbean. I'm Sebastián Oliel of the Communications Department at PAHO, and today we're holding this joint press conference from Santiago, Chile, and from Washington, D.C., United States. And you can follow us via this Zoom meeting or uh, on PAHO and ECLAC social media accounts. We would like to thank all the journalists who registered to participate and who have sent their questions ahead of time for this press release. And we would like to remind you that you can send us your written questions via email at media team at paho.org or conferencia prensa at cepal.org and also by using the zoom chat room using the q and a button please remember to include your name and media outlet before asking your questions we would also like to remind you that we have simultaneous interpretation into English and into Spanish during the session, and you can choose the language by clicking on the interpretation button. Please take into account that our spokespeople will be addressing you in both English and Spanish. The launch of this new report will be led by Dr. Alicia Barcena, Executive Secretary at ECLEC, as well as Dr. Carissa Etienne, Pan American Health Organization director, who will give you the main findings on this report. First of all, we would like to acknowledge ECLAC's executive uh, secretary for her presentation, and then she will be followed by PAHO's director's remarks. And that will be followed by questions and answers by our journalists. And without further ado, then I would like to give the floor to Dr. Alicia Barcena, ECLAC's executive secretary. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. It is a true honor for me to share this presentation with a dear friend of mine, Dr. Carissa Etienne. We have shared some core messages and we have worked on this in collaboration between the Pan American Health Organization and ECLAC. And I would like to, first of all, acknowledge the teams that have worked on this. Of course, Dr. Carissa Etienne and Dr. Jarvis Rosa, Dr. Titelman, Jorge Rodriguez, and others who have been actively collaborating in putting this report together. The core message in this report is that we cannot talk about reopening our economies unless we keep the pandemic under control. And this is the main conclusion of our report. Therefore, what I will share with you now are some of the outcomes on the issues addressed by this report, especially the issues that we are facing and the core tenets that we must follow in order to achieve this very important convergence between health and the economy. COVID-19, shown the spotlight on the relationship between health and the economy, and it has uh, exposed structural weaknesses in our healthcare system. It shows that health is a human right and is a, a fundamental public good that must be guaranteed by the state. It sounds easy, but for decades now, we have forgotten about this very core tenant. And the access to quality health care services is essential because it's a basic infrastructure for our lives. And without that, we cannot talk about economic development or social development for that matter. Health is part of our human capital and it directly impacts the productivity and economic as well as social development of our people. The healthcare sector is a sector of our economies. It's not just a social aspect, but economic as well, which also has a lot of workers. It has a lot of productive linkages included, and it creates jobs and investment at large scale, which is very important for economic growth. But this pandemic exposed our fragmented and segmented healthcare system, a public spending that's very far from the 6% suggested by PAHO, and that at this government, uh, central government level is only 2.6%. So 
3.9 at the very in the best case scenario and over a third of ex spending in healthcare expenses comes from people's pockets 34 percent to be specific and about 95 million people must invest for example on catastrophic healthcare related expenses so people have to pay out of pocket whether it's because of cancer or any kind of terminal disease and oftentimes they lose all of our earnings and about 12 million people fall into poverty because of this in addition to that the availability of physicians and hospital beds in our country uh, between the, the the ratio between what we have in our countries and those by OECD is half percent, and that also takes away from important diseases. COVID has resulted in the largest and deepest social and economic crisis, and it has exposed a lot of issues in our countries. A lot of countries, as we're going to see in a few minutes, are at the epicenter of this pandemic, and they are leading in terms of transmissions. This is in a region where we already had inequality, which became deeper as well. And there's also more poverty and social and economic vulnerability. And the gap between men and women and ethnic groups have become even greater because of the pandemic. A high degree of urbanization, which has led way to higher transmissions, and a third of the population in Latin America and the Caribbean live in cities that have 1 million plus people. And in addition to that, the pandemic hit the, the richer neighborhoods or areas first, and then it slowly moved into the poorer sectors of the cities where there's informal work, lack to basic services or utilities such as running water with the high devastating effect that this means. So this, access, this underscores the social and economic impact of this pandemic. And this already happening in, in a social and economic scenario that was that was weak to begin with. We have been seeing the middle class hit very hard over the past seven years. This is a graph by Bajo that highlights the fact that in the Americas, that includes 52 countries and territories, the trend that we see is that over 140,000 new COVID cases daily on average, for example, this is over the past week, week. So this is the issue that we're facing right now in the Americas. And like I said, and the report exposes this clearly, we're in the worst crisis in the century. The GDP will be will drop by over 9%. Poverty will reach 231 million people, out of which 98 million will be in extreme poverty. And this without even taking into account the impact that social actions may have that hopefully they will help, but we will see what happens between now and years end. But this, has, this is the forecast without taking all that into account with a high unemployment rate that will increase to 13.5%, which means that there will be 44 million people that are unemployed in the region and segmentation uh, and and informality and polarization will increase in our labor markets. The supply and demand will impact income, therefore people will not be able to buy, their purchasing power will be reduced, and for example, companies will be impacted as well, and about 2.7 million formal companies will have to go out of business, and our exports will also be dropped by 27 percent there's also a high risk for this food cri uh, this health crisis become a food crisis which m makes it even worse for health care purposes we will have about 96 million people in extreme poverty which means that their incomes will be not it will not be enough to cover basic uh, food needs. And the rural population, of course, will be much more impacted than the urban population. 90, 29% of poor people live in rural areas and 11, versus 11.8% 11 in urban areas. And the truth of the matter is that there are areas that are will be much more impacted in a region because of the food crisis. For example, the Caribbean, because it imports all of their food, the dry corridor, Haiti and Venezuela as well, because they are two of the most vulnerable countries in the region. 
action has been taken and the civil society has been playing a very important role in providing support in, during this crisis. But inequality, like I said, has increased the Gini uh, index by in by 4.9 percentage points, and the countries that have, have been affected the most are Argentina, Ecuador, and Peru. Argentina's inequality levels were, let's say, less darking than the other countries in the region, but still the Gini coefficient increased in Argentina by 6%, Brazil, Chile, Salvador, and Mexico between 5 and 5.9%. So we have very severe inequality issues in the region. We can also see that eight out of 10 people will have lower incomes than the three, less than $500 a month, which is below the poverty line, which means that 490 million people would be below the three lines of poverty level. And like I said, 37% of them will be below the poverty line per se. Now, the groups that are particularly vulnerable and who have a fragmented access to health care are, well, senior citizens in our region, which are about 85 million, 13 percent of the population, with high risk of lethality, like we have seen in our regional experience. Also, informal workers, 54 percent. Uh, is the level of informal employment in our region. And informality means that they have no uh, form of uh, safety nets. And women, women are highly impacted. Almost 60% of people in formal sector are women, especially in some sectors like the healthcare sector. The majority of our healthcare workers in our region are women, 78.8%. Women have also been subjected to higher levels of uh, domestic violence, higher pressure at home, and lower access to uh, sexual and reproductive health. We also have the indigenous people, almost 60 million of people, 9.3% of the population. We have seen that some indigenous areas are highly marginalized and they can be highly impacted. Also, Afro-descendant uh, population in Latin America only, excluding the Caribbean, 130 million people or 21% of the population with high risk of transmission, especially because they have much higher comorbidity. Also, pe persons with disabilities, 70 million or 12% of the population in America, in Latin America and six. 0.1% in the Caribbean because they cannot have access to their ongoing healthcare services, but also their level of transmission is higher. And also migrant men are women that are discriminated against, that have lower access, and that also have limited access to their places of origin. And in many cases, they can go back. A clock considers that we, we have more than a decade that has been lost. By the end of 2020, the GDP per capita will go back 10 years and poverty levels will go pu push us back 14 years. That is to say, we will have lost over a decade in the region, in GDP per capita and in poverty. And what the report is seriously suggesting is that we cannot talk about reopening our economies without seeing the transmission curve under control. There's no resumption of economic activities unless we can focus on testing, traceability, and confinement. There's no health versus economy dilemma. It is health. Unless we control transmissions, we cannot reopen our economies. And healthcare measures must focus on controlling the pandemic, quarantine or lockdown, social distancing, and of course, how to control lockdown. Well, through social actions that enable us to soften or, or cushion the effects in terms of income, in terms of productive capacity, and this could ensure compliance with so healthcare measures. Unless we control the pandemic, we cannot talk about reopen our economies. And we also have to focus reopening on closing the gaps in, so in socioeconomic determinants of health. Now, there are five proposals that we have been discussing from the past. So basic emergency income for six months, equ equivalent to one poverty line, a supplementary bonus to fight hunger, the equivalent to 70% of extreme poverty line, 
universal, progressive and distributive social policies. That must be the horizon that we must shoot for. Also to extend uh, grace periods and provide uh, more flexible terms, especially to small and medium-sized enterprises because they will help uh, keep the lockdown in place and on the other hand, reopen our economies. In order to achieve all this, we will need expansive fiscal and monetary policies that would enable us to uh, hold on longer because this pandemic will be with us for a while. And that's why we need non-conventional instrument, which leads us to the fifth one, which is access to favorable financing conditions for middle income countries, especially the Caribbean, which is highly indebted and highly vulnerable to climate change effects. They are in full hurricane season. So this would be 2% of our GDP, the, the, the bonus to fight hunger, if we do it for all of the population in extreme uh, poverty, 0.52% of the GDP, and emergency action, 2.7% of GDP. They are all complementary, and they, the basic emergency income would be to cover the basic needs and sustain consumption in households that are under the poverty line. A lot of countries have also done it already with monetary and in-kind uh, investment. The region has already invested 2.3% and in, in conditional investment, we had invested 2.3%. And this is needed to, in order to give those 231 million people $143 a month. And of course, we need to supplement this with the, uh, the hunger bonus with $67 a month for those who are in extreme poverty. So in the end, at the end of the day, what we need, and this is what the report is suggesting, is to change our strategy. We need to rethink the future in a different way. And this is key. We must make our societies understand how urgent it is to have universal access to health. We need to have solidary fund financing. That is to say, regardless of uh, repayment capabilities, all societies must have access to health. And for that, we need to invest in infrastructure and in human capital. We will need new technologies in order to be more efficient and more productive in our healthcare systems in terms of digital infrastructure, telehealth, traceability, and testing. And scientific evidence is key. We re-understood the importance of science, and we need to address the social and economic determinants of health in order to reduce vulnerability and especially strengthening primary health care. And this is especially key. Health must be seen as a public good, and public health must be the core tenant in our healthcare system. And for that, we're going to need expansive fiscal policies. That is to say, we will need to broaden our spending in health. Uh, we will need to expand our regional productive systems. Our countries are agree in terms of pharmaceutical aspects, healthcare. Uh, vaccines, medical equipment, etc. And if we can reach this agreement in three phases, we'll be able to achieve this. Control, re reopening, and reboosting, we'll be able to rebuild our societies. Once again, I would like to thank you. Thank you, Pajo, and my dear friend, Chris Etienne, for this opportunity of working jointly, which was conceived in order to know, not ha not choosing between health and economy. Health always comes first. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alicia Varsena. And now I would like to then give the floor to Dr. Carissa Etienne at Pajo for her remarks. Our region has reported the highest number of new COVID-19 cases globally. And several Latin American countries are currently at the very epicenter of this pandemic. Exactly six months ago, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a public health emergency of international concern. At that time, our region had just eight cases, none of them in Latin America and the Caribbean. 
No one could have imagined then what the future would bring. As we fast forward, we see a starkly different picture. As of today, the region has reported almost 9 million COVID-19 cases, nearly half of them in Latin America, and nearly 350,000 deaths. And transmission keeps accelerating throughout the region. It's no surprise that a pandemic of this magnitude has ushered a triple crisis across our region as it ravages our health systems, fractures our social protection, and destabilizes our economies. Despite vigorous and early action from many countries in the region, COVID-19 has cut thousands of lives short and it has disproportionately impacted the poor, those with underlying health conditions, and those for whom healthcare is out of reach. This pandemic has been fueled by inequality and laid bare how people across our diverse region are being left behind. COVID-19 has exposed the interdependency between health social protection, and the economy. A stable and productive economy depends on a population that is healthy and well, as Alicia so well said, and a strong economy in turn supports the health and well-being of the population. Unfortunately, the pandemic has disrupted many essential health services including programs that people depend on to manage conditions like chronic diseases, HIV, TB, and malaria, immunization programs, programs for mother and child. And, and we're beginning to see that as a result of these disruptions, patients across our region are dying from these treatable conditions at higher rates than normal. Today, Chronic diseases, the Americans, HIV, TB, the Americans and malaria are at risk. Immunization of programs, losing programs for mother and child gains, in and, a and we're beginning to months. see this is tragic. We face a challenge without precedent, one that requires strong and well-funded health systems to see us through this crisis and, and allow us to recover. There, there is no doubt that countries need significant and sustained interventions to suppress COVID-19, to protect health gains, and to tackle the mountain poverty and inequalities throughout the region. We must affirm that health is not a privilege nor a commodity. It is a fundamental human right and a public health good. The health of our communities and the health of our economies depend on it. The Pan American Health Organization recognized the evolving triple crisis of health, social protection, and the economy early on during this pandemic. Realizing that we needed a multifaceted approach, I reached out to my dear friend and colleague, Mrs. Ms. Alicia Bassena who is the Secretary General of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, so that our organizations would work together to support countries as they face this unprecedented crisis. So with Mrs. Bassan and ECLAC, PAHO worked jointly, and today we are launching this new report, Health and the Economy, a convergence needed to address COVID-19 and retake the path of sustainable development in Latin America and the Caribbean. My sincere thanks to Alicia for having said yes. The report recognizes that the structural deficiencies that we are witnessing in the health sector are the result of years of inadequate public investment. Over the past decades, public spending in health while slowly increasing, has been persistently low, and in many cases, totally inadequate, and far from PAHO's recommended 6% of GDP. Now we face an almost impossible challenge. Economies are strained, 
impacting investments in health and social services for the foreseeable future, as was so well demonstrated in Alicia's presentation. At the same time, significant additional financing is needed to control the pandemic and to recover public health losses, to enhance social protection and support economic recovery. This is a reality that we have been dealing with way before the COVID-19 pandemic. Health outcomes in the region are intrinsically linked to our economies, to the social determinants of health and the safety nets that have been established to protect health and well-being. That's why we must integrate our approaches for health and social protection. And in so doing, we can mitigate against the terrible impact of COVID-19 on our economic livelihoods. So those who are sick don't have to choose between their health and having a roof over their heads or food for their families, or worse yet, of falling into poverty from a medical bill. Today, households across our region cover more than a third of healthcare costs from their own pockets, what we call out-of-pocket payments. And what is worse, many of those have to do that at the point of care. And for nearly 95 million of us, these bills are catastrophic. And for well 12 million or more, 12 million people or more, it causes financial impoverishment. Health should address inequities in our region and lift people from poverty, not the other way around. It's for this reason that universal healthcare remains a core tenet of health and development. Even in this time of crisis, where we must ensure that everyone, irrespective of income, ethnicity, or gender, has access to quality care when they need it, without incurring financial hardships. Our joint report recognizes these challenges and looks ahead with recommendations on what countries can do to recover. Countries must avoid thinking that they must make a choice between reopening economies and protecting the health and well-being of their people. This, in fact, is a false choice, and I want to say it again. This is a false choice, the choice between health and, the, and restarting the economy. We have seen time and time again that full economic activity cannot resume unless we have the virus under control. And to attempt otherwise places lives at risk and extends the uncertainty brought by the pandemic. In this report, we have outlined policy recommendations to tackle the challenges across three different phases of recovery, control, reactivation, and rebuilding. And Ms. Bassana referred to those. Although these are distinct phases for which we have specific guidance, the recommended actions should be grounded on a core set of principles to help countries converge their health and economic policy. Health and well-being must be seen as prerequisites for reactivating the economy in the context of COVID-19. Health protection is both an ethical imperative and a necessary condition for restoring productive capacity. In short, if the pandemic is not brought under control, economic reactivation is unconceivable. Recre reducing inequalities is a central linchpin for all phases of the recovery process. Countries must work to minimize the financial impact of, of this public health emergency on the most vulnerable by removing barriers to care, providing financial safety nets, and supporting basic needs like food and water. Social protection is key, both as a response to the immediate crisis and as we rebuild more inclusive, equitable societies. Prioritizing health and strengthening health systems based on the primary healthcare approach is at the very foundation of our pathway towards recovery. 
Stronger, resilient health systems require countries in our region to increase public investment in a highly resolutive first level of care. We also need to accelerate digital transformation that the countries are already beginning to, um, to invest in and position health at the very center of such efforts to improve access while also making data readily available. We must strengthen the interaction and agreements between government, civil society, and the private sector to formulate strategies with multiple actors and support from broad sectors of society. And, and this must be managed with transparency and favoring intersectoral collaboration. Let me remind you that reactivating our economies must be done gradually based on evolving data about the virus's spread and our health system's capacity. Data must always guide our actions against this virus. And Pahua and ECLAC are providing a benchmark but each country will need to be responsive to their own national and local context. All of this will require strong political leadership and significant investment to affect to effect change. Recognizing the impact of this crisis, we call on, on all countries today to invest the recommended 6% of GDP to strengthen health systems. It's the right thing to do, and it will help us be better prepared to face future waves of this pandemic, but also future outbreaks. The Pan American Health Organization is committed to working with our member states in accelerating the response against COVID-19 and to addressing its vast consequences in the Americas. We welcome ECLAC as a key partner uh, in the work that they are doing, but also in a jo joint effort towards recovery. This pandemic has underscored that health is a right and that right should be guaranteed for all. And our national governments have the responsibility to guarantee that right. When some are left behind, all of us are at greater risk. And this pandemic has showed that shown that. Even as we continue to be challenged by COVID-19 and its health and economic impact, we must not lose sight of realizing our vision of health for all. Now more than ever, we should work towards equity, ensuring that everyone across the Americas can have a healthier, longer life. Now more than ever, we must create the necessary health and economic conditions so that we truly leave no one behind. Thank you. And with me today is Dr. Barbosa, our assistant director, and he will uh, with me contribute to the answers to your various questions. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Dr. Etienne, y muchas Thank gracias you very much, Dr. Etienne, and also Alicia Barcena for her remarks. Now we are going to have the questions that we have received via email or chat. As we mentioned in this section, we will also have Daniel Edelman, who is the director of economic development for ECLAC and Mr. Barbosa with PAHO, who will be able to add to the specific questions you may have. So the first three questions that we have received are the following. Daniel Collin from TN23 Guatemala says the following. Guatemala started to have the economic reopening by applying traffic lights to warn us of the situation. Is it advisable to implement this type of measure when we know that we have not reached the peak of the pandemic? And then we have the next question, Ugarte Jimenez from El Semanal Costa Rica. The question is, how has the pandemic impacted on the informal economy in the region and what are the projections in this area? And the third question is by Margarita Batias from ANSA, the Italian news media. She is a 
She is in Santiago right now, and she's saying that Santiago, the capital, has had four months of absolute lockdown, and this is a milestone worldwide. And my question is, is it possible for small and medium companies to resist such a pandemic? Is there a balance between health, care, and also the daily livelihood and what is going to happen with those who are in the informal sector. And the next question is that the effort for a vaccine seem to be a competition, a market competition, rather than an attempt to help many. Why is it that the international organizations were not able to have joint efforts to be able to overcome this? This is a call to come to come all of us together, but it seems that each is going to look for their own individual solution in detriment of the others. And then with these three questions from Guatemala, from Costa Rica, and ANSA, I give the floor to Alicia Barcena first. Your microphone is muted, Dr. Barcena. Could you please please unmute your phone? You can't open her. No, no la estamos escuchando todavía. We, we can't hear you, Dr. Barson. Unfortunately, your mic is muted. Okay, now you can, right? Thank you very much. My apologies for that. Well, in terms of the question asked from Guatemala, and thank you very much, by the way, for joining us. We are simply observing and reviewing what the presidential orders are from Guatemala. We have seen the agreement that was reached and that includes very clear provisions regarding how they should use this uh, health warning system being used in Guatemala. This is a warning system that talks about the region, different areas of the countries, the severity of the situation, etc. And the issue of this traffic light system is a very powerful tool because it gives some guidance to people regarding what places, what times of the day uh, they can better um, are better to go to a certain place. So unfortunately, we don't have much more to say regarding Guatemala. We believe that this dashboard or traffic light system is very important. They have, you know, the red, the yellow, orange, and green. And this is also done by sectors, which we find extremely interesting for the public sector, you know, public transportation, restaurants, the industry, etc. So I think there's a significant effort in trying to organize people's activities. So for these questions, I believe Pajo is in a better position to answer regarding the health care aspects. But like I said, at the observatory, that we have for the pandemic, we are looking at what Guatemala is doing and the reopening with this traffic light system, which we believe could be very useful for the people. That's question one. I don't know if you want me to move on to the next question, Sebastian, or should I hear from Dr. Etienne on question one, and then we will move jointly to two. Yes, let's move to, quest to Dr. Etienne for question one again. Um, uh, lifting the public health measures. Uh, the decision to introduce, adapt, or lift public health measures should be based on a risk assessment that balances the risk of relaxing measures, the capacity to detect a resurgence in cases, and the capacity to manage extra patients in healthcare facilities and the ability to reintroduce these public health and social measures if they are needed. We also recommend considering a geographic approach to lockdown and opening based on the transmission in specific locales as appropriate. Key lessons from the pandemic on social distancing are to be carefully uh, introduced. Do not open too fast or you risk a resurgence of COVID-19 that could erase the advantage gained over the past few months. You cannot reopen if you are in the stage of community transmission. 
The adjusting of measures should not be taken all at once, but should start at the subnational level in areas with the lowest incidence and gradually increase to the other phases. And basic individual measures should be maintained. The washing of hands, the wearing of masks, and social distancing. The protection of vulnerable populations has to be central in the decision as to whether you're going to lift or maintain a measure. Some measures could be lifted where population density is low. Similarly, restrictions could be lifted for some of the workforce that are be before allowing 100% to return to, um, to business. One of the primary issues with the implementation of public health measures in Latin America and the Caribbean is, and one of the question refers to that, the number of workers that are reliant on the informal economy. And, and this is why PAHO is calling on authorities throughout the region to make sure that public health measures accompany other social and economic protection measures so that people do not have to choose between their health and sustaining themselves and their families. Over. Thank you. Bueno, en relación a la pregunta número dos, eh, Oh, okay, regarding question two from Oscar Ugarte, journalist at the Costa Rica University, that talks about how the pandemic has affected informal workers and what the forecast looks like. The structural weakness in our region is that our informal sector is way too big and stopping at freezing the economic activity has greatly impacted all labor markets, but especially informal ones. The ILO by the way, we joined another joint report, estimated that about there's 158 million informal workers. So that, that those are the estimates. And actually, we're talking about 54% of the total people that are employed. And within the informal people, we know that some have some kind of contract, but whose employers do not pay into the social security system. And they are also self-employed workers. And honestly, people in the informal sector have been highly exposed to losing their jobs with high cost, high risk of uh, being fired, no unemployment insurance. And for example, domestic workers, females, and that's what we we're talking about, women being highly impacted or people that work at small mom pa stores or that are self-employed coupled with the issue of restrictions on mobility cannot provide services from home. We have estimated that only 26% of the total number of workers can truly telework because they do not have access to high quality internet connection that could truly help us help them telework. Now, informality has always been some kind of cushion in the labor market, but it this is not the case now. Why? Well, because people are not looking for jobs and people are leaving the workforce. But when reopening does occur, of course, there's going to be even more informality. And it's very hard to support informal workers with some kind of uh, assistance or basic income like what we're suggesting because we don't have any records on many of them. So some countries are making significant efforts to broaden that registration capability and that's why it's so important for citizens to truly register so they can be brought into the social safety nets that are being implemented. We say that we need to move towards a universal healthcare system and social protection system for all, not just uh, workers in the formal sectors that are paying into the social security system, but rather all. And we believe this is key. And let me conclude by saying that in the case of Costa Rica, we must highlight that Costa Rica and Uruguay, two countries that have uh, a lot of uh, social safety nets, had not been affected very much for the pandemic. Thank you. One of the one question that's pending has to do with the vaccine. So could you speak to the efforts that international organizations are making in order to have fair and equitable access to a vaccine? Thank you. I'm 
Sebastian, I'm going to pass this question over to Jabas, who, you know, in PAHO is leading the effort on uh, uh, the access to vaccines and working with WHO and Gavi and COVAX um, for this. Jabas. Uh, gracias, gracias, directora. Uh, Thank uh, you, I Madam Director. We are making global efforts to develop a vaccine against COVID-19. And I believe this is the largest effort that has been made to date globally in order to find a vaccine. We have over 150 prospect of potential vaccines with uh, over 10 of them being in, uh, in the clinical trial phase. Now, the big issue is how can we ensure equitable access to the vaccine? The World Health Organization is leading a large effort, global effort, with support with many countries in Europe and the Americas, private partners, etc., to have $8.5 billion to support the development of new vaccines and quickly deploy the vaccine when ready to be used with the population at large. So there is a mechanism to accelerate the development and access to that, which is a COVAX facility. And the Pan American Health Organization is actively involved in that effort by providing support to the countries in the region. We have a revolving fund for vaccines that's 40 years old, that is very effective in purchasing vaccine on behalf of the countries in the region in order to ensure access. So far, we have 38 countries in the region that have sent letters of adherence expressing their interest in being part of this uh, COVAX facility and by acting through Bajos Revolving Fund. Since there are a lot of vaccines today, we don't know which is the one that's going to have the best performance. So with this facility, we can meet the objective for all countries in phase one of the vaccine to receive equitable access to 20% of their population, which will be enough to provide vaccination to people over the age of 65, senior citizens that have some kind of chronic disease, and healthcare workers, which are the three most vulnerable groups. And then in the following stages, all the different groups or sectors of the population will receive the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barbosa. Now we are going to move on to the next round of questions. No, we still have one. We have one that was by Margarita Bastilla, I think from the Italian news uh, outlet, because she was asking about three things that Chile has been in lockdown for three months, that this is a milestone, and also what is going to happen with uh, people in the informal sector and small and medium companies. Our report has a very clear message. There is no possibility of an economic reopening without controlling the curve of transmission. The doctor has also included an analysis of the risks and also an analysis by the medical team. That is to say, the medical teams need to have the ability to offer the necessary care. So control is implemented through health measures. And the truth of the matter is that it is very important to enhance traceability, monitoring, and also diagnostic tests and i think that this is what the what is being attempted at least in the metropolitan area of chile and in other countries in the region now many cannot generate their own work revenue and we have seen that in chile the unemployment rate is going to be even higher than in 2019 when it was 7.2 and in 2020, it will be 14.5, and then poverty will move from 9.8 to 15 percent. So the only way to flatten the curve is by including social measures, including the vulnerable middle class that has precarious jobs. Seven out of 10 Chileans make less than $500 a month in a huge amount of them much less. So this is a concern, as I mentioned before, the informal economy is 
uh, situation, for example, in Chile, we have 28.5. It is far from 54%, but it's still a significant figure. And it is important also to measure to mention that we need to strengthen and also enhance social protection for these sectors. How can the small and medium companies resist? Most of the companies have had drops in their revenues in their income given the various financial obligations so the impact on the small and medium companies will be much higher we estimate that 2.7 million companies in the region will be closing their doors and 2.6 million are micro companies and about 104,000 are small and medium companies so what we are suggesting is that it is very important to be able to support these companies with longer terms because if we are only going to give them a short-term loan, this is just like having a, a very heavy life jacket. So we do need to maintain their productive capacity and their workers for a longer period of time. And this is what we could answer, Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we move on to the second block of questions. The first one is by Orlando Milesi of Interpress Services, and the question is, what is the strategy that is the most appropriate to make it possible to have work again with health protection? And also, he's saying that after these months of the pandemic, do you see any progress towards a new development model and a multilateral solution, or are governments still working separately and under the usual systems? Ms. Pastrana from Pie de Pagina, Mexico, is saying that the virus has spread first through the tourist areas and second through the food supply chains. And this cannot be stopped without causing extreme damage to the poor areas. And the poor areas have been the ones affected the most by the disease, given the inability to have water or enough spaces in their households for the physical distancing measure. And she's asking whether there are specific measures to protect the, the most vulnerable populations. She's also saying that the Secretary of Health of Mexico has referred to health solidarity in the region to face the pandemic and contrary, for example, to the closing of the borders. And he is all, she's also asking whether there are conditions to think that there could be regional measures to address the effects of the pandemic and what would that, those measures be. Also, Daniela Pastrana from Pie de Pagina, Mexico, is saying that the Mexican government presented a multi-sectorial policy to foster healthy nutrition and also to reduce chronic diseases. And they are one of the main risk factors and fatality taking into account COVID-19. And she's asking whether it is feasible to implement this strategy, how and when could this be assessed? And finally, for this block, Ruben Figueroa by, from EFE Chile is saying that ECLAC and the United Nations have suggested to implement a basic income plan in most countries. Some countries have offered some economic assistance, do you think that this is enough or is this far from what we need? And also given the data that we currently have, do you believe it is possible to have a recovery if we have a vaccine in the short term? So then with these questions by Interpret Service, Pie de Pagina and EFE, EFA, I am going to give the floor first to Dr. Etienne. So, um, thank you. Um, I'm, I will deal with the first question, um, the strategy to, um, to reopen work again and uh, with, um, with health protection. Is there any progress as far as this new paradigm of development? Um, so, the, the, Pandemic is global, national, regional, and 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 local. Um, we uh, it, it is really impacting all levels of society. 
but disproportionately impacting vulnerable populations, particularly in the informal sector. And, and these people do not have the financial resilience to sustain long periods of confinement. And, and so the report is saying that particular attention must be paid to these population groups to allow them to support physical distancing and other public health measures, included food and income subsidies during this period to support individuals and families during um, the pandemic. And, and we believe that this should be considered as a financial investment in the economy, as through the allocation of subsidies, Countries are in fact contributing to viral suppression and flattening the curve and allowing countries to move to reopen earlier. Um, but as I said before, this has to be done right. It has to be based on data and science, and it has to be in a measured way, depending on the local health and socio and the socioeconomic um, context. And, and this whole question of social protection is extremely important, and particularly when we deal with the poorer sections of the of of of, of, the, of the population. And um, I, I I really do believe that our governments must begin to look seriously at, at having a multi-sectoral approach to a new paradigm, to new national plans for economic development, but national plans that are inclusive, that includes all of society, that allows people to, um, to be part of the planning process, that seeks to engage private sector and civil society. Um, this is imperative if we must move forward to new economic models, and it is clear, and I will leave that to Alessia because that's, that's a, her area of expertise, but it is clear that we need a new economic paradigm that takes into consideration the lifting of people from poverty, the addressing of the inequity that is so much part of us, and paying specific attention to the poor and to the vulnerable and, and introducing social protection measures that allows them to move out of where they are and to be able to access social and economic determinants of health, including um, access to health as well. Over. Bueno, muchas gracias. Muy, muy Thank important. you very much. This is very important. And thank you very much for your answer, Carissa. That is key. That is what we need to protect health as to the business world and the world of jobs, I think it is necessary to draft specific protocols for each sector. And PAHO has been working on this significantly. We have been also looking into how each economic activity sector will be able to guarantee the health situation of their own workers and in their own situations. But we need to draft those protocols with the health authorities that need to become, again, the stewards in this period. And also with the commerce chambers and also the trade unions, the worker organizations that could reach an agreement as to how new measures can be implemented to be able to respect social distancing and also the reorganization of shared spaces such as cafeterias and restrooms and also the various health measures to be implemented in shared spaces. Public offices will also need to implement specific protocols together with the authorities and this is key. Also the digital aspect is key. The region has more than 70% access to digital services, but we need to improve the quality and the capacity of the digital technologies so as to implement hybrid telework systems and also in-person systems and to be able to reach out to all of the territories. And also it is key to reorganize public transportation. We do have a serious problem there because we were all moving towards a mass system that was even power dependent. But now we will have to look again into this. We will have to look into the cities. We will have to look into the housing directives and also even shopping centers as well as reorganization. This also implies a very significant change also in the use of 
facial masks, and this is something that will have to be maintained as well as the cleanliness of the transportation means as to whether we see progress being made in a new development models or not, I don't know. I would say that this is the worst crisis of the last 100 years. So it is a concern to me to act like that. Yes, we do see progress being made in the environment because there are fewer people in the cities, but this is going to change. We are going to go back to pollution when we go back to the economic activities, but I am concerned in the sense that it, environmental budgets are being, of course, cut short, but we cannot stop paying attention to the fact that the next crisis will be a climate change crisis, and this is somehow that we need to study seriously. I understand that we are facing a situation that it will imply a change forever, a change in the way we buy products, we use products, we live with others. So this is also going to entail changes at the level of the countries, the societies. They are all rethinking how we will operate. For example, many companies in the regions are now manufacturing fans, if we think of, for example, or, and respirators, if we think of wine producers, for example, they are producing hand sanitizer. So there is the ability to adapt. And I hope that the idea prevails, that we do need to change our paradigm. We do need to change our economic model to move on to a more sustainable model, make of this world a better place to live. And I think that the great social challenge is to have a new social pact so that we can have a welfare situation that is based on universal policies. Just let me give you an example. Women, women, women who are in charge of the care of other people who are not receiving any pay should receive some basic pay, some basic wages, because what they are doing is providing a service to the society. So we need to have no social, new social tax packs and also the idea of changing the paradigm so that we can, for example, include new modalities for energy production with a lower consumption of carbon, lower carbon production and, and use. And I need to, with we need to rethink. We do have the ability to do it. I hope we can do it. And in our region, we do need to think about the a market that is more integrated. We have 650 million inhabitants. We need to have more solidarity towards the smaller economies. For example, the Caribbean economies that are highly affected by the drop in tourism and also climate change. So I do think that we need to have clear solidarity and we also need higher integration to be able to create value chains, for example, in the production of uh, medical equipment and medicines, and we are working on that. I do think it is the right time to rethink what we are going to do and whatever we do in the short term will determine the long term. We do not need to break down the emergency in what we will have later on because both things are going to be closely linked. Thank you very much for all of your responses and we'll move on to our next uh, round of questions. We still need to uh, reply to Daniela Pastrana from Mexico, I think. Daniela Pastrana's question has not been answered yet. She asked several things. She said the virus went uh, spread through tourism and then production um, chain. So maybe Carissa can talk about what we could do in these sectors. And uh, of course, then we have the issue of the Secretary of Health in terms of vaccines. And I believe that Pajo is in a better position to respond to this. And then I can answer the third question that has to do with the multi-sectoral approach, you know, healthy nutrition, water, health, et cetera. What do you think? I think that sounds good. Go ahead. So, so, so well, uh, 
O yo puedo contestar, si quieres, este, If you tabla. want, I can answer that one question. What I can say is that in the report, we recognize that the poorest communities are more vulnerable to transmission because of overcrowding, lack of utilities, and we underscore the importance of primary health care. We believe that if we strengthen our primary health care systems, we would be sending a very strong message. This is what the report highlights. And it's so important to reach these marginalized and overcrowded communities. This is extremely important. And I believe that after that, better access to healthcare is one, of course, then ongoing monitoring of new hotspots. For example, here in Chile, we opened a health um, centers to take away from highly overcrowded locations. So we move people to these um, new health centers and also expanding housing to um, the poor sectors of the population. For example, in Mexico, there's been very important initiatives in this sense. We see the National Survey on Income and Expanded from 2016 says that 35% of the population have piped water and 27% has irregular access and 27% had no running water, they need to go get water from the river, from a well, etc. So water is the bread and butter of this whole thing. So I believe that expanding basic services, for example, if we're talking about reopening economies, well, there's one sector where governments must invest, and that is the health infrastructure in all of our countries. We cannot have one person without access to running water or clean water. We must also look at the healthcare infrastructure to have wastewater treatment. That is to say, these are areas where we may have some kind of economic reopening or reactivation. That is key. Now, in terms of Mexico's initiatives, I would like to highlight one in particular, and that is the what Mexico uh, put forward at the General Assembly and over 170 countries joined Mexico in ensuring equal access to purchase of medic medicine, vaccines, and medical equipment. This is extremely important, that is to say, access of the poorest countries and the correct management for this pandemic requires a global coordinate in uh, response with solidarity. And in this case, Mexico has taken very important initiative, including the initiative from the Caribbean Latin American communities where they invited different authorities from PAHO and others. For example, they called on us and FAO and others to work together. And this is what this is all about, to have a coordinated strategy. And talking about coordination between health and nutrition, etc., I believe that social determinants in health is the key, are the key. What are social determinants to health? Access to water, to healthy nutrition, to primary health care services. And in the case of Mexico in particular, Mexico must reduce, for example, in obesity levels as well as uh, diabetes and hypertension levels. All these comorbidities that people have in Mexico are very high and they need to be reduced. And all, you know, they went through H1N1 and SARS and all this requires us to think about zoonotic risks. That's something we cannot overlook. We need to look at what changes must be introduced in agriculture, in the agro-industrial production of foods, of medicines, to make them healthier. And also, of course, the labeling must uh, reflect all this. That's all I have to say, Sebastian. Dr. Etienne, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. I, I think um, Alicia has touched on, on most of the important uh, important points, but um, certainly um, ensuring the social, and PAHO has preached this from 2014, 
access to the social determinants of health, um, to safe water and, and sanitation, to education, to um, um, uh, healthy, healthy, decent work, and um, to uh, in, ensuring basic environmental um, um, principles. So we, we have stressed that significantly in mm -hmm. PAHO, um, but still, our, our vulnerable populations are lagging behind. And let us not forget our indigenous populations who themselves are, uh, many live in remote condition, um, 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 situations. Our rural populations, the Afro-descendant populations that suffer discrimination and stigmatization um, in, in their countries. These are also very much at risk and tend to work in informal informal work arrangements but many of them don't work at all and so they they face those um, issues on a daily basis so i believe that our governments are going to have to target those um, vulnerable populations and they know who they are they know where the vulnerable populations exist in their countries and 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 i think very importantly this pandemic and the increasing cases they show off where the vulnerable population is and who is the vulnerable population. And governments will have to target these people to ensure that those social protection mechanisms are introduced there first in those that are most vulnerable, that the environmental determinants of health, that they address those. And Alicia mentioned this in terms of the hand washing and, and water facilities. And it may be that they just need to uh, um, erect sinks, sinks and, and, and soap in, 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 various, in various points within those, those localities. But I, I don't want to rehash. I think most of it has been said. I, I certainly want to talk about primary health care and the primary health care approach, because most of the people don't have access to basic health care. Um, if we see the disparities in, in our region, we have a, a low doctor per 10,000 population ratio, lower than the OECD. We have 20, OECD has about 30, 35. But what is worse is that in Latin America particularly, we, there is a, a move to specializations of, of, of doctors. And so we do not have doctors with who want, first of all, to work in the first level of care, who are trained for working in the first level of care, but that's where the majority of our population live. It is in communities. And so we need to have human resources that are targeted at working in those communities and understanding individual and collective health. We need, we need human resources that understand the essential public health functions, that understand the very basics of public health, but that these people are sent to work in the areas of vulnerability. We have the situation in, a, in, in, in Brazil, for instance, and Brazil is one of our better countries in terms of the first level of care. But even there, some 60 million people did not have access to doctors at the first level of care. So it, it, it is something that must be prioritized and targeted, and, and both for the social de um, determinants of health, for social protection, and including access to health. Over. Bien, muchas gracias a ambas. Eh, estamos llegando ya Thank a la... you very much to both of you. We're reaching the end of this uh, press conference. We're running out of time. But I would like to read a question from ba Blanca Valadez from Milenio in Mexico. It has two parts. The first part is what impact will the pandemic have in the healthcare sector in economic terms, which is addressed in the report? And could we revert this falling into poverty? This is for Alicia Barcena. And for Dr. Etienne, the question is, do we see an increase of more um, neglected diseases as a result of uh, the pandemic and specifically measles. So Alicia Parsena, maybe you can, you can address the first part. Yes, of course. You can hear me, right? Yes, go ahead. Well, undoubtedly what we have seen is that a CLAX estimate as of July 15th state 
that we will see an increase in poverty between 2019 and 2020 of 7.6 percentual points, going from 41.9 to 49.5 percent of the total population, and also an increase in extreme poverty in six by 6.3 percent going from 11.1 to 17.4 in 2020. As you see, our estimates are kind of different from what Conival does because we are based our estimates on monetary poverty, but then we also have extreme poverty, which has to do with access to basic food and then access, and they're both going to increase, like I said. And undoubtedly, this is closely related to loss of jobs because this will impact Mexico greatly, of course, where we will see about a million formal jobs go away, according to estimates by the Mexican Social Security Institute, which accounts for basically 4.9% of the total number of jobs at the beginning of this year, which was 20.5. So, of course, there will be a significant job loss. The worst month has been April so far, and there will be a change in formal employment as well. Now, as far as impact on health, from a CLAC's point of view, what we can see is that there has been job creation in general public administration jobs, especially in the healthcare sector. And now as far as uh, Social Security, 37,000 jobs were created. So, of course, this is uh, to be noted because Mexico has recognized that their health care system was underfunded with a lot of gaps. And so this administration received the public health with a high deficit, but they were able to expand um, uh, hiring almost, they all added almost 40,000 healthcare workers. And this is very important. They have also increased the capabilities of the social uh, security institute as well as private hospitals and armed force hospitals who have played a very active role. This is worth noting. Now, as to whether it could be reverted, well, of course, that is what we all hope for. And obviously, job creation and injecting resources in the poorest households is of utmost importance because right now Mexico has almost 21 million people that receive federal government transfers. 11 are women, 8 million are senior citizens and about 6 million receiving Benito Juarez and for middle level education 4 million youth building the future. So all this is on top of people receiving um, some kind of uh, bonus for disabilities, etc. So I think that the Mexico's administration during phase three of the pandemic decided to, first of all, avoiding having their healthcare system collapse and they focus on reconverting hospital, they hire more healthcare workers. And second, they wanted to focus on income, providing income to people, uh, some kind of relief package. And I believe that this uh, addresses the questions asked from Blanca Valadez. This is what we have to say at least. Thank you, Alicia. And the next question as to health whether was whether you see an increase of those under uh, unattended Gracias. diseases and those that have not been okay. cared for. Uh, so so th thank you. Thank you very much for this question. And I'm happy you brought it up because um, this is an issue that we need to address. What, what we are seeing is that um, with the extent of the response to COVID-19, that the essential health services are, are, are being neglected, so to speak. Um, several reasons. One, because healthcare workers have been withdrawn from the first level of care to, um, to hospitals to um, engage in the, in the immediate response. Also, um, people do have a certain fear of going to health facilities, um, considering the risk of, uh, of transmission of COVID-19. And some of them 
actually don't really know whether the services are open or not. So there is a combination of, of factors, but we are seeing several effects in terms of essential health services. Already, we are measuring excess mortality. And we are in the countries that we have worked with and we are, we are, um, we are given technical cooperation, there, there is excess mortality happening. Uh, one of the important areas is our non-communicable um, diseases or chronic diseases. Uh, these people are of increased, uh, first of all, they are older population. And because they have a chronic disease, they are at higher risk of severe COVID-19 infection. And of course, the only risk that they face was the, uh, um, the non-compliance because they don't have access to medicines and, and, and for maintenance of, of the care. And so these people are facing higher um, mortality and we will, we will begin to do much more work with countries so we can um, establish this. As well, we are seeing a reduction in immunization services and, and some of it in a country we were looking at yesterday, as low as 35% coverage, 20-something um, percent coverage. And, and um, this is coming from a high of a 90, 95% coverage. So we are at risk of outbreaks of measles, outbreaks of polio, outbreaks of diphtheria, um, whooping, whooping cough, and tetanus. And this is, I think, an extreme country or country that is very vulnerable, but we, we know that across the region that our immunization programs have suffered. And these are essential, essential health services. We also know that we are seeing reduction in uh, maternal and child health care uh, attendees. Um, certainly in one country, we had a 40% reduction in the attendance of um, antenatal and prenatal, prenatal care. And we were already seeing a 12 to 14% increase in maternal mortality. And, and, and so um, we are taking this long-term view that most probably we will we will record an increase of maternal mortality um, um, for, for this year. Mental health. I mean COVID itself and the situation that it that that the um, measures to um, reduce transmission um, they themselves engender significant stressful situation and, and cause a mental health um, 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 impacts and our mental health services are not coping and, um, and persons don't know how to access those services. And so we are already seeing the increases in femicide. We're seeing the increases in domestic violence. And, and we expect that depression and anxiety will, will also, will also um, 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 increase. We have the same, same issues for malaria. Um, we are recording, and we looked at those figures, we are recording a reduction in the detection of cases of malaria and the reduction in number of tests for malaria that are, that are, being, that are being administered. And, and, and so we know that particularly in this region where we had a, a, a target, an objective of the elimination of malaria, particularly in Central America, we know that that's going to that's going to be to be to be affected. The same thing for HIV and the access to HIV treatment, and and for TB as well. We are seeing um, in in we are seeing issues with the management of TB, with the treatment of TB, and don't forget also that that access to those to those drugs depend on the. <coughs> availability of these drugs in the country and within the, the sub, sub localities. And we have difficulty with transportation of international transportation of, of, of these medicines as well. So essential health services are suffering. Um, we need governments to pay some much more attention to strengthening the human resource capacity in essential health services for utilizing digital and, and other innovative approaches. And we've been working with them on, on some of this, particularly in immunization and for chronic diseases, where we, we, we encourage them to use other, other places for immunization programs, to use where people go frequently, like in the banks, et cetera, so that we can keep and uh, maintain our immunization coverage or even um, increase those even within COVID. 
What is true is that this region stands to lose the gains that we have made and gains that have been very costly, very costly in terms of human resources, in terms of economic resources, but in lives. We've been able to save many lives because of those gains that we have made. And, and because of the, uh, the fallback that we've seen in COVID-19, um, we can lose some of those gains. I, the same goes for um, neglected infectious diseases. We may well see a resurgence of some of the neglected infectious diseases in areas um, where they had been uh, reduced um, significantly. So this calls for a holistic approach to health and health services, even within COVID-19, with a focus on the first level of care, with a focus on utilizing primary health care approaches, with a focus on using information and data to, um, to inform um, what is happening, but always with an eye to the most vulnerable and to, um, to, to the poor. So this is where we are at in this region. It demands a concerted effort of all of us, governments, uh, in, international um, organizations and agencies, and, and persons on the ground to ensure that we can deliver health care um, at the level that is required and um, close to people and focusing on those that most need it. Over. Muchas gracias, Dr. Etienne, y muchas gracias. Thank you a... very much, Dr. Etienne. Thank you very much, Dr. Barsina. We are now coming to the end of the time that we had agreed for this session. Now we would like to invite you both for some final thoughts in connection with this report that was presented today and about the convergence between economy and health. First, I am going to give the floor to the executive director of ECLAC and next to Dr. Carissa Etienne. Thank you very much. I think that we are facing a topic where we have clearly seen the importance of funding health systems so, so that they are no longer segmented, fragmented, so that we can actually offer coverage universally to the whole population. There is no potential economic reopening without controlling the rate of transmission through public health measures. And we will continue to repeat this. And also we need to have traceability monitoring and also risk analysis as was as it was properly said by Dr. Etienne for the countries, and there were some questions to that end. The countries may not have enough resources to fund this uh, expansion that we need of the public sector, and clearly we will need to resort to multilateral funds, the IMF, and also the international banks at the regional or international levels, and I think that we need to support the countries and I hope we can do this through loans or better with concessional lending for those poor and more vulnerable countries. And I think that we are willing to continue to cooperate with PAHO to continue to help the countries. I think that that is our main objective. There are some questions that are still to be answered. For example, EFE, Mr. Figueroa was asking whether governments are doing their homework or not, but we were asked that 30 countries here in the region as of July 30th had included 190 social protection measures and also the in-kind transfers have also reached 69 million households. And I think that this is also benefiting 209 million people, 44% of the regional population. And now we are going to assess how these measures may or may not decrease the poverty rates and also extreme poverty rates that we have estimated and whether it is possible to have reactivation to support these key sectors of health, infrastructure, water supply. But I think that the political message is the most important. That is for us, it is key for health to be recognized as a 
public human right. It is not a commodity. I really liked Carissa's uh, expression. It is key to offer this type of health with dignity and our policies should focus on that and also to build this social pact so that our region can overcome this incredible pandemic and also all of its structural historical gaps and we can finally overcome defeat the pandemic and come out in a better situation so that we can have more of an inclusive policy to have equal conditions for growth. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Thank you to the Executive Secretary, Dr. Barsena. And now I give the floor to you, Dr. Etienne. Thank you, Sebastian. In, in closing, I really want to express my gratitude to Alicia and her team from ECLAC and to my own team at PAHO, and of course, to all of those who have participated in this important event to launch this, this report. Um, it is clear that ECLAC and PAHO will continue to work um, in socializing this report, and, and very importantly, on uh, working in within countries to, for technical cooperation so uh, we can help countries as they embark upon a new paradigm um, for, for the economy. It is true that we are living in very particular times, a time when COVID-19 is directly impacting the health and well-being of millions throughout the Americas. The health sector we recognize has the lead role to play in tackling this pandemic so that economic activity can recommence. But we need to begin planning for um, this uh, uh, renewed efforts as far as the economy is concerned. And first and foremost, we must protect health. Otherwise, reactivating the economy will simply be not possible. So I, I'm calling therefore on the heads of governments in our region to take up this challenge with vigor to tackle COVID-19 so that we do not lose too much ground in health gains that we have reported in recent years, to scale up investments in health and prioritize those people living in conditions of vulnerability, and to adopt a whole of government and a whole of society approach so that we can together overcome this pandemic and build resilient societies with the necessary economic opportunity and social protection for our people. Solidarity has to be at the core of all that we do. Solidarity in country and solidarity across countries um, in the Americas and beyond. And so this joint report will be a tool for governments, not only to navigate the current crisis, but we hope also to start a dialogue among all sectors and even among countries on how to work for this convergence between health and economy for the future. Let's not fool ourselves, crises like this may well come, come, come again, but based on our lessons learned together during this pandemic, I hope that we would be better prepared. And so I take this report as the beginning of something else, the beginning of a change in the way that we organize our economies, our social protection and protection mechanisms and health systems. We have always been aware of the interdependency of health and the economy in the Americas, but it is now more than ever that we must take up the mantle to implement the necessary health and economic measures to tackle COVID-19. And, and I dare say that it is now more than ever that we must build inclusive health and economic sectors that work in the interests of all leaving no one behind. So thank you once again, and uh, you will be hearing much more about us as our two institutions begin to work with other institutions across the region and with all of our countries. Thank you so very much. Muchas gracias. Ahora sí, entonces hemos llegado al final de esta conferencia. Thank de you very much. We have now reached the end of this press briefing. Thank you, Dr. Etienne, Dr. Barcena. Thank you all for connecting and participating. Let me tell you that we will be sharing the presentation on uh, ECLAC's website, as well as on PAHO's website, as well as the joint report. We have not been able to answer all of the questions that we have received, but you can continue to contact us at 
Pajo and ECLAC, and we will continue to answer the questions. And now we conclude this session. Thank you all for participating, and good afternoon to all of you. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. Thank you, Carissa. Thank you to all the team of ECLAC and, and Pajo. Bye bye. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, everyone.